taking a look at the results from test one, address a couple of issues, a couple of questions that come up about tests typically after the first one. So this was your section's distribution on test one, 11% um, A's all the way through the 18% F's. That's almost 40% D's and F's. That's a relatively high number, but not totally atypical for test number one. Um, I've had that number be 50% or more on test one in some sections. Your average of 72 is actually not bad overall. Uh, but let me just say a couple things about the test and grades and, and whatnot. Usually there's a question right away about curving the test. I have never curved a test ever in the way that I teach this course, mainly because there are 220 points, which is more than 30% of your grade, that are really easy to get, right? 100 of them are what you're working on right now, right? Attendance and participation. You guys, most of you will probably get 80, 90 or more of those 100 points, okay? If you're consistently showing up and answering clicker questions, that's going to help. What's the other 120? The learning curve quizzes. And really, everyone should get all of them. And because they're 120, they're equivalent to a test score. And typically, I'll have, you know, two-thirds of the class get 120 out of 120. So that's where the curve comes in by you guys coming to class and doing the homework quizzes. Um, in addition, I've been emphasizing right from the get-go the importance of going to supplemental instruction. Here are the numbers just for your section on test number one. So the SI attendees, about 20% of you attended these sessions, had almost a 75, which is a C. The folks who didn't attend had less than a 72, which is a C minus. There was an even more dramatic split on this in the 8 o'clock section. The overall effect was significant. It was running at about 75-ish to 70 overall for the two sections combined. The good news is that we've already got 20% of you going to SI. By the end of the fall semester when we first did this, our total um, affected students was about 40%. So we're already halfway there in terms of getting you guys to go. And again, this is the most important thing I think you could do to help yourself um, succeed in the course. Okay? They're running these sessions. They're not there to just do test prep. They're not there to reteach things that I've already taught in class. If you've attended, you know that you do a lot of the work. There's a lot of interaction. There's a lot of focus on examples and so forth. So um, I don't want you going to SI sessions thinking that they're there as tutors who are going to reteach something or to give you a list of things to know for the test. That's not what they're going to do. Okay? But they are going to be really helpful. And I bet that when we look at test two results, this split will be bigger. And what I'm really hopeful to see is a jump in the folks who didn't attend before test one, but then choose to go for test two. Okay, when we did this in the fall, there was about an 11% increase in their scores. They went from like a D plus C minus to like a C plus B minus when they didn't go before test one, but then saw the light and went before test two. Okay, um, I've got a fun little video. All of our SI leaders were tasked with coming up with a tip of the week for you guys. And the video I've got for you is actually the two male SI leaders that we have, Harrison and Tim, who are um, with this kind of gag reel or blooper reel, ultimately going to reveal a, a suggestion for what to do to be successful in this class. So let me just play this. The 8 o'clock section really like this because these guys are kind of goofy. Fantastic. Hi, I'm Tim. Hi, I'm Harry, and you'll be like, and we're the two prettiest SI leaders. <laughs> Just kidding. You can say that. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Tim, and this is my second semester doing supplemental instruction for Psychology 101. Now you gotta say, like, in a little bit about me. <laughs> uh, I'm a second year, I'm really involved in campus, I... Yeah, just say something about yourself. <laughs> um, Hi, something, say something. Good morning, my name's Harrison. I'm a third year, uh, okay, I gotta not say, uh, okay. Okay, okay. okay. And then our tip would be, so at the end of each section of the chapter, of the online textbook, of the online textbook, do the summary concepts quizzes. 
Maybe she just turns, turns blue, that'd, that'd be pretty funny. funny. Turn her face is blue. Yeah. I wish the green screen was behind us so we could have like a uh, <laughs> cool background. Like a corn. Sitting on the beach or something. Yeah, just put like a piece of watermelon or something. That'd be pretty funny. <laughs> 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 Oh, well, and then you and then you say you go through all of the um, vocab verbs. Vocab verbs. Vocab verbs. Yeah. Words. 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 <laughs> words. 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 So this is our video, guys. In Instructional Technology Services, put this together. I think it's actually kind of fun. Um, again, that's what I, I would emphasize as much as anything. In addition. I sent you guys a little announcement. Oh, that's the, the schedules for the week. Um, so Haley's going to be doing one today at noon. Shyla at 2. Tim um, in the video on the right is going at 4.30 tonight. I sent you guys a little announcement slash email yesterday. I know you guys don't read email. I know emails for old people. But it was my attempt to give you guys the best I can give you when you teach 500 people suggestions for how to do better in the class in terms of study strategy so this is from um, Sanford University um, I think they're in Birmingham and this guy is really really good in giving you five little five to seven minute videos with suggestions about how to study and here's what's great about it this is not like his own ideas about like, well, my aunt told me one time, here's what you should do to study more effectively. This is all based on research about learning and memory that we're going to be covering in this section of the course. And it tells you specifically strategies for being more successful, two of which we talked about back on day one. One of those is retrieval practice, which is pulling things back out of memory. You do that in SI sessions. You do that when you're doing your learning curve quizzes. The other one is called distributed practice. He'll talk about that in one of these, which is the opposite of cramming. If you want to do all your studying the night or two before the test in a few weeks, it's not going to work as well as if you start doing things now and spread it out over time. So it's worth your time. Let me put it this way. One of my best friends here in San Diego called me back in the fall, and he said, my daughter is struggling in this anatomy class. She's at TCU, and she's struggling in this anatomy class. Can she call you and talk to you about how to study better? I talked to Laurel for about 30 minutes and I said, I'm going to send you a link to the videos that I think are the best thing that you can do. This is exactly what I sent her. So this is what I send to my best friend's daughter. I'm giving you the best I've got for trying to help you um, study more um, su successfully for test two. Questions on any of that regarding the test or any other housekeeping details? Good. All right. If you were on top of things, and I know not all of you were, you were supposed to have done what before you came in here this morning? Yeah, watch the sensation and perception lecture over here on the lower left side. I know not everyone has done it because the number of views has not made my YouTube video go viral, which is very, very disappointing to me. Um, so I am not going to go back and reteach what's in there, but I am going to continue from where that left off. So if you haven't viewed it, really you need to get in there and view it. But this is a chapter that it splits into two about as neatly as any chapter does. So even if you haven't done the sensation recording yet, you're not going to be completely lost this morning. But what I'm giving you here to get us started is the list of the five big ideas for the day. Okay, so this is about as much spoon feeding as I ever do because this is the list of things that you need to know something about for test number two okay so we're gonna talk about the first one bottom-up versus top-down processing I'll tell you now that's the number one of the five things that people struggle with the most one of the SI leaders who was here at eight came up after class and she said can you give me a couple of other ideas for reviewing bottom-up versus top-down because that's what students feel like they're a little bit confused about. So I gave her a couple more ideas for how to do that. We'll talk about perceptual parsing. Really, really simple. You're doing it right now as you look at the screen. You're looking at black figures on a yellow background. We'll talk about the gestalt principles, which have to do with how we perceive um, holes in our environment, W-H-O-L-E-S. 
Um, we'll talk about depth perception cues. We'll talk about three different types there. So there are monocular, binocular, and motion cues related to depth perception. And then in the last five or ten minutes, we'll do these perceptual constancies. They're really, really easy. Okay? Things like why um, are we still able to understand when we fly out of Lindbergh Field that when we fly over Ocean Beach, Ocean Beach hasn't shrunk down. We know that it's still the same size it was before, and all those cars and trucks and buses are the same size, but the image in our visual system is much, much smaller. We still, because of perceptual constancies, understand that those things are just like they've always been down there. Okay? So um, the sensation section that you'll view in the video is the section that looks at how we take incoming environmental stimulation and turn that stuff into signals that can be used by our central nervous system, that is our brain and our spinal cord. So when you view that video, and I know a lot of you haven't, you're going to learn things like how the visual system works, the parts of the eye, the parts of the ear. One of the huge concepts in that sensation lecture is about receptor cells and how receptor cells for things like vision and hearing take sights and sounds and turn those things into action potentials. Okay, so the visual system, we know we've got a visual cortex in our occipital lobe in the back of our head. Well, if I opened up the back of your head and shined a light on that part of your brain, you're not going to say that you see a light. Okay, it needs to come in through your eyes because you have these things called rods and cones that convert or transform the light waves into action potentials because that's the language of your brain. Okay, that visual cortex speaks action potential. It doesn't speak light waves. So you'll look at that stuff. And as I mentioned in that lecture, the sensation segment of this chapter is really more biological. And it's about the earlier processing that we do of information. Whereas perception, what we're going to talk about today, is the later processing. And it's less biological. And it's more psychological. It's more knowledge-based, as it says on the slide here. It's more about what you've been thinking about or what experiences you have or what expectations you have and how those things influence how you perceive things in your environment. So as we go through this today, you're going to notice it's a heck of a lot less biological. I'm not going to have parts of the brain up there. We're not going to be looking at parts of the visual system or auditory system or really any of that stuff. Okay, we're going to go in a different direction. So let me bounce down to um, the perception section. We've already had this on the slide, but I'll just leave it for a second here. So perception has to do with the organization and interpretation of sensory stimuli by the brain. So rather than being data-driven, like light coming in through our visual system or auditory input coming in through our ears, this is what we might call knowledge-based processing, where we're making sense of things in our environment. So the example I think I used at the end of the recording is that when we move from sensation and perception, for something like hearing, we're moving from talking about hair cells transducing sound waves into action potentials to talking about things like the mental image that you have of the sound of your mother's voice versus the sound of your brother's voice. Right? So when your phone rings and it's your mom, there's almost like a picture that pops up over your head, a, a picture of her. Right? If your brother calls and you hear his voice, there's a mental image that pops up of him in your head. Okay? If we were cartoonists, we might even draw little bubbles and you're picturing um, that person. That's perception. That's where we're moving towards this morning. So with perception, we're talking about how we process, organize, and interpret these sensory signals. Again, it's later and it's more psychological. So let me just even be explicit about that here. So this is going to be later, and it's more psychological rather than being um, biological. Okay. Look at me just going crazy with the cursive. It's like watching a circus act here. Okay. So later, more psychological processing when we're talking about perception. It results in an internal representation. And this, this little phrase always makes me think of something like a, a mental image, if you will. 
right? A mental image of your mom versus your brother. Or I think another example I used um, in that lecture recording was, you know, the picture of a lion versus, in your mind, a mental image of a kitten, right? Based off of the sensation that you have with your auditory system, the sound that a lion makes versus the sound that a kitten makes, you end up with a different picture here um, at the level of perception. I feel like I'm getting a little hum with the mic. All right. So this is all about perceptual organization. So what we're going to do, as I said, is review those five big ideas that begin with bottom-up versus top-down processing. Okay. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about bottom-up. We'll spend our most time talking about the top-down processing because I think that's a little bit more slippery and I think I've got better examples there. All right, so let's talk about bottom-up versus top-down. How would we define this? Well, bottom-up processing begins with the sensory receptors. It begins with things like rods and cones for vision or hair cells for hearing. And then it works up to the brain's integration of that sensory information. What does that mean in English? It means that this is a building or assembly sort of process. So when we do this, we are building or we are assembling something. That's what it means by bottom up, right? So we are going to be building or assembling information here when we do bottom up processing. Um, I, I like to think about analogies for this kind of stuff. This would be, when we do bottom-up processing, like when you would play with Legos and build something as a kid. Or if you like Lincoln Logs better or you like something else, I don't know, to, to build, right? Just blocks or just a pile of sticks or rocks or whatever, right? So we're building something up. So I'll give you an example. When we are new readers of the English language, what we do in our reading is we do a bottom-up processing kind of work where we're combining letters into words. And then we learn to combine words into phrases and phrases into sentences, right? So when we read aloud, for example, when we are in like kindergarten, we have to do something different than what we do later on, right? So if the word that we're reading is stop, okay? and we are four or five years old in preschool, kindergarten, whatever. How does a kindergartner read the word stop if they don't know how to say it right off the bat? What do they do with the sounds? I hear some of you guys doing, right? Each piece, so they go s t a p s t a p s t a p stop, stop. Oh, it's stop. Okay, I got that, right? Do you guys remember Between the Lions? And they used to push the letters together. How many of you guys ever watched it? I know you did, right? The knights, you remember the knights pushing the letters together? and That's what you're doing here, right? You're doing this bottom-up, constructive, building, assembling kind of process where you're taking pieces and, in this case, you're pushing together the sounds to combine those letters into the sounds of words, okay? That's what bottom-up processing is like, right? It's sort of like when you're building up the skills in some sport or some kind of activity and you're learning the building blocks and at a certain point you build up all those necessary skills okay that building up of the skills is really at the level of this bottom-up processing and then what might happen later on is you might find yourself doing top-down processing I gotta come up with a better definition because when I went over this with the 8 o'clock I'm like I don't even know what this means when I look at it. Let's look at it together. Information processing guided by higher level mental processes as when we construct perceptions drawing on our experience and expectations. What does this mean? Well, rather than building or assembling, I would say that the word you should think of with top-down processing is we are sorting things at this point. So we've built an adequate foundation in whatever the area might be, let's say. Okay, we've built up skills as a musician or we've built up skills as an athlete. And now we're going to sort new incoming information in light of that experience that we've had. Okay, 
So what we do with top-down processing is we see new things in light of our experiences. Okay, here's a, uh, an example I think might help you guys. Right, when I tried to teach you the mechanisms through which neurotransmitters were binding to receptor sites. How did I use top-down processing? Well, I said that when a neurotransmitter binds to a receptor site, it's like a what doing a what? Like a key going into a lock, right? So I was trying to assume you had already done the bottom-up processing of keys and locks. I, I want to assume that you know that much, right? And now I've got this new thing that you, I need to help you make sense of. And I'm going to help you make sense of it by helping you sort it or divvy it up into something that you already know something about. Okay? We could argue that that's a top-down kind of process where I'm helping you make sense of new incoming information based on what you already know. Okay? And it turns out that good teachers are really good at doing that. Right? That good teachers can take something that you're not experienced with and say, well, this is kind of like that other math problem we did before. Here's the one way in which it's a little bit different. But we can help you make sense of this new stuff based on what you've already been exposed to. Right? So if you know something about fractions, that can help you now as we start maybe working on percentages. Because percentages are just about fractions over 100. Right? So that's a way to do this sort of top-down processing. That's actually a pretty good example. Write that one down. Um, so bottom-up versus top-down, I want to be explicit here and let you know that you're doing both of these things all the time. Okay? So when you're you know, just living your life and doing your work with sensation and perception, your perception work involves both bottom-up and top-down every day. It's not like you wake up today and you're like, oh, it's, it's top-down Tuesday. That's all I'm doing today. Not doing any bottom-up kind of thing at all today. No, we're doing both of these things all the time. I will tell you here that what we're going to spend our next five or ten minutes on is reviewing a set of examples of this top-down processing. Okay? That's where students seem to struggle a little bit more. That's where, honestly, I've got some better examples to make sense of this. So um, we'll run with that for another five or ten minutes and hopefully nail this down. So. Let's run through those examples, and after I've run through all of them, I'll stop and see if there's still any further um, areas where you need some clarification. So a couple of examples of top-down processing would include what we call priming. And the coughing is just all over the place today. And context. So we're going to talk about priming and context. Let's just focus initially here on priming. What is priming about? Priming, it says here, means that prior information will alter what we expect to perceive. Okay, So what does that mean? Well, it means that when we're primed in some way, <clears throat> maybe we've been reading about or thinking about or maybe watching something that has us sort of thinking in a certain way. Okay, or thinking about certain topics. Let me give you a, a concrete example. Let's, let me split the class into two. And I'll just stand in the middle here and say, if you are on my left here, let's pretend that I have assigned you a, an article to read, and the article that you're going to read on the left side of the class is an article about farm animals. All the different kinds of animals that live on a farm, what they eat, what kinds of stuff they do on an everyday basis. Cool. You're reading about farm animals, chickens and goats and all that. You guys on the right are going to be assigned a different article. You get to read an article about popular pets. Okay? Different kinds of pets that people might keep in their house. Dogs and fish and all kinds of stuff like that. Cool. So you're reading about farm animals. You guys are reading about pets. Let's imagine after priming you in that way, I gave the two sides of the classroom, the following fill-in-the-blank question. I asked you to fill in the blank after C. So C blank blank. How are you going to fill in the blank? Well, you guys on the left who've been reading about farm animals have been primed to probably fill in the blanks with what? What are you going to write here? Cow. How about you guys on the right? Cat. How did I do that? Right? 
all I did was I primed you with the reading assignment that I had given you, right? So that makes you start thinking in a certain way. So we're going to do a couple more examples of priming, and then we'll come back and talk about this thing called context, where the context in which we receive information can alter it too. I'll put that back up. Don't worry. We'll come back to that. All right. So <clears throat> I need someone to be my reader for the next slide. Actually, this slide right here. Something's going to drop in. It's got four words, and none of the four words are more than four letters. So does anybody want to read aloud to 400 plus people? You ready? This is going to be exciting. You look very enthused about it. I like, I like that. All right, so here we go. She's going to read out loud what pops up on the screen here. Here we go. The man said hi. The man said hi. That's fantastic. We should probably applaud for her um, because she said the, the, she said the man said hi. Why didn't she say um, Tai Mun Shid I? Shid, yeah, like past tense, right? Um, <laughs> how did you know it was the man said hi? Because if you look at it, these symbols, the H slash A symbols, they could be A's or H's. You know how she knew? Because her experience, this is a really good example of top down, right? It's about experiences serving as a filter. Maybe that's a way to think about top down, right? Your experiences help you filter new incoming words, literally in this case, that you were reading. And her experience as a reader of the English language led her to go and say, the man said hi, okay? Instead of the opposite of each of those A slash H figures. Does that make sense? So that's another priming example. Um, I've got one more here that I want to do, I think, on priming. Yeah, I do. I have one more. All right, let me prime you this way. Let's split the class again. Left side of the class. I want you guys to think about ducks and how awesome ducks are. They go quack. They fly. They've got webbed feet. Ducks are awesome, right? That's the left side. Right side of class. Don't think about ducks. When you think about rabbits, rabbits are really cool. They're soft. They're furry. Got big floppy ears. Like the Easter Bunny is going to come soon. Cool. Rabbits. Okay. Ducks versus rabbits. This is, feels like a Bugs Bunny. Um, it's duck season, rabbit season, duck season, rabbit season. All right. So having been primed to think about ducks or rabbits, let's see what you see when you look at this next picture. Some of the duck people might say, I see a rabbit because there's something horribly wrong with the duck. <laughs> right? He's drowning. His ass is below the th level here. He's like tipped back. He could be intoxicated. We don't know. Okay? The rabbit is a little bit e easier, admittedly, to see. Right? Here's the rabbit's ears. I guess if you're the duck side of the classroom, that's the, the bill of the duck. Right? But it's something that based on what you were told to be thinking about, you might more quickly see one or the other. So I can prime you to be ready to perceive it in a certain way. Does that make sense? So again, the idea of filtering, right? You, you're, you're filtering these new experiences based on what you've recently been thinking about. All right, let me bounce back to the overview of um, top-down. The other example top-down that we're going to talk about is context. The context in which we receive information can change what we perceive. Okay. Well, let me tell you in the front end here. I'll give you, uh, uh, I'll give you a tip and, and, and um, I'll make a deal with you. I'm not going to give you any questions on test two that make you distinguish between these two because I think there's enough overlap between priming and context that for an intro class, it's not useful to say pick priming or context. I just want you to understand that both of them are about this top-down sorting or filtering kind of work that we do. So you won't need to distinguish between the two, but you will need to know that these are both top down. So what does context mean? It means what's going on around me or around the object that I'm looking at can influence how I perceive that person or that object. So let me give you a concrete example. Okay? If I want you to perceive me as being particularly tall, and I'm going to get my picture taken. Who should I get in the picture with me so I look really, really tall? 
short people or maybe like a bunch of little kids, right? Let me get a bunch of kindergarten kids. We'll put them around me. We'll take a picture. I'll smile. And it'll be like, Dr. Lamekis, is, he's actually a pretty tall guy, okay? Let's change the context. What am I going to do now? Now I want to take a picture and I want me to look really, really short. So who do I recruit to be in that picture? Bas everybody always says basketball players, right? Let's get a bunch of seven-foot NBA centers. I can't even, like, let's bring Shaq in, right? He's big enough to be able to eat me, right? <laughs> Actually, saw him play in person. He's the biggest human being I've ever seen. Um, and, and Duke beat them, by the way. Um, I'm surrounded by the NBA centers, and now I'm like, he's, Dr. Lamex is really short. Did anything change about me at all? No. It's the context, right? So the context in which we perceive things can alter perceptions of individual items like that, right? Think about this for like your real world life. Like if you want to appear really, really smart, who should you surround yourself with? <laughs> People maybe not as smart, right? If you want to make yourself look not particularly bright, surround yourself with all the geniuses, right? So let me give you a couple other examples here of context. The first one is actually pretty darn similar to my height example. But now we're talking about the size of the circles in the middle here. Those two circles in the middle, the one on the left or the one on the right, which one might be perceived as being bigger? The one on the left might look bigger than the one on the right. Why? Because its context is one in which it's surrounded by smaller circles, whereas this guy over here is surrounded by much bigger circles. Okay, so in fact, what do we know is true? They're the same size, right? The two circles in the middle are the same size. But the context might influence how you perceive those two circles in the middle. All right, let me give you um, another one here. Um, which of these two lines might you perceive as being longer than the other? Well, the one up top you might think is longer. It looks longer than the red one. In fact, they're the same length, okay? Context can be created by the title of the slide. So let me show you this picture, and the context is, I'm going to tell you, it's going to be a picture of a young beauty. I promise it's not inappropriate, okay? So here's a picture of this young beauty, and then I've got one more picture. My title this time is, it's a picture of an old woman, okay? Dude, it's the same picture, right? Young beauty, old woman. Okay, so let's look at this for a second. How many people don't see the young woman yet? It's just always just a couple. Let's point out parts of the, the young woman here. So what is this on the young woman? Her eye, what's this? Her ear, what's this? Her jawline. Now, hold on a second. Just the guys. Just the guys. I only want the men to respond to this question. What is that, guys? Who wants to volunteer one of the guys? What's that called? Usually the guys will say, it's a necklace. Okay? And then I'll stop for a second. Let me just ask the women. What is that? Choker. That's the fundamental difference between the sexes right there. Okay? <laughs> there are a couple guys who will know ch what choker is. Most guys generally, when I started teaching this, I did not know what a choker was. I thought it sounded kind of inappropriate. Um, so <laughs> the choker apparently for guys who don't know put this in your notes if you didn't have sisters or whatever it's a tight necklace is that, is that a good definition? does that work? remember I, I, I mentioned this in passing in the beginning I'm one of five boys growing up I went to an all boys high school I have three sons we don't sit around talking about chokers <laughs> other than like somebody misses a free throw at the end of a game right and loses that's where the chokers are alright um how about the old woman? How many people don't see the old woman yet? You notice that? It's amazing. Every time, it's much more problematic for you guys to see the old woman. What is the choker now for the old woman? Her mouth. She's got like no teeth. What is this now on the old woman? she got a big old nose there. It's crooked. Oh! Did you, did you hear it? The ear becomes what? Her eye. Let me erase all the scribblings. How many people see it now? All right. Anybody still not see it? Okay. <laughs> There's always a couple. So again, with the old woman, the choker becomes a toothless mouth. 
What's the neck become here? It's like her chin. It like sticks out like a good old lady kind of chin. Right? Here's a big crooked nose. So the way, I think the easiest way to, to explain it if you don't see it is, whereas the young woman's turned a little bit more away from you, the old woman is more sort of directly in profile to you. Okay? But the point is, this context is created by the title of the slide. And you might see one or the other more quickly depending on what that title says. That says. Does it say young woman or does it say old woman? Okay? So that covers big idea number one, which is bottom up versus top down. Questions on any of that, especially the top down, either priming or context examples. Does that make sense? Okay. A good thing to try to do as you're preparing for the test would be, you know, could I generate another example or two of some of these priming or top down things? Has there ever been a time when you've been primed to be thinking about something and it affected how you perceived something? Okay. You might be able to think of an example or two like that. All right. Big idea number two is called perceptual parsing. This is pretty easy. I think the term is actually more complicated than what it's referring to. What is it about? It's about doing what you're doing right now. Okay. I'm betting that every single person in this classroom, when they look at this slide, sees an incredibly bright yellow background right, with black letters projected onto it. Is anybody looking at this seeing a black background with yellow figures on it? I don't think so, right? So the most important aspect of how we parse things is how we divide up between what we call the figure and the ground, okay? Right now, the figure for you guys is black and the ground is yellow, okay? If you're lying on the grass somewhere looking up at the sky this afternoon, you're seeing a blue ground and if there's high white puffy clouds, you're seeing little white figures up there. Okay? If you're looking at this periodic table of the elements, I don't know why you would be, but it's a white background, white ground, with black figures, or over here in the noble gases. Like that? Somebody had chemistry recently in my house. Those, that, that's right, isn't it? There, that's red on a white background. There's all kinds of stuff in my head. I know some chemistry, and I'm relearning some geometry right now as well. Last had geometry 25 years ago, and now I got proofs of SAS and AS, ASS is not one in geometry. Okay, so figure and ground, right? Perceptual ambiguities are the way in which we could turn this thing that works 99.99% .99 of the time on its head. What are perceptual ambiguities? Well, they're basically situations where you can flip figure and ground. What do you mean flip figure and ground? Well, take the thing that's the figure and transform it so that it becomes the ground and take the ground and make it become the figure. Okay? So reversible figures is the term that we use for this. I'm going to show you about three of these. I've got about three or four more lined up that I found online because one of the places you see reversible figures a fair amount is in logos. Okay, people... Who, who do that work to create a logo for a company, many times um, you'll see reversible figures sort of um, sneaking in there. And it's not by accident. It's, it's on purpose. And I'll, I'll show you a couple of those examples. Does everybody get the idea? Right? So if you're writing in your notebook right now, it's, it's a white piece of paper and you've got a blue pen. It's, it's a white ground. And what you're writing is the blue figure. Okay? Figure and ground. So again, I think the term perceptual parsing makes it sound more complicated than it really is. Let me show you my examples I've got built in. I think I've got um, three or four of these in the slides. The first one is probably the most common one that is ever used to explain perceptual parsing. I know it's been on the back of like a Cheerios box because I remember my kids sitting there like looking at it like, wow, right? Remember this one? Somewhere along the line. How many of you guys have seen this one before? It's usually the majority of you guys. Yeah, okay. So it's either two faces which are white figures on this bluish background. Or if it's the bluish figure on a white background, what is the figure there? A vase, or if you spent a lot of money, a vase. Okay. Or if you were an altar boy or altar girl, it could be the chalice, right? There you got that going on. Whatever it is, right? It's either two faces or that vase. It's reversible, right? Blue can be the background or blue can be the object. White can be the background or white can be the object. Here's another one. 
If these are black figures on a white background, it looks like little stick figure guys maybe walking down some stairs, right? What if you make it white figures on a black background? Arrows pointing up and to the right and then down and to the left. Okay? We can just flip them. Really, reversibility is about flipping figure and ground. Here's another one. This one's pretty cool. Right? It's either a giant white skull on a dark background, or if you flip it, what does it become? What do the dark figures become here? Two people, what are they doing? Drinking a lot. Right? So there's a woman on the left with a daringly low-cut dress. There's a guy wearing a giant puffy, like, clown or minstrel outfit here. I don't know what is going on. Right? What's the bottom of the chin of the skull? The tablecloth, right? What is the, the, the top of the skull? Maybe it's like the moon or a spotlight or something like that, right? The eye holes become their heads. The, the nose hole here becomes their sleeves hanging down. So that's another example of one of these reversible figures. Again, figure can become ground and ground can become figure. Does that make sense? Let me show you a couple of the examples that I pulled in um, because I got here early enough before the 8 o'clock class to do so. Um, for logos... Have you ever seen the reversible figure in the FedEx logo? The arrow. How many of you guys have never seen the arrow before? Do you see it now? Life-changing, right? <laughs> Do you see the old lady in there? No, the old lady is not, not in there. So there's FedEx, right? USA Network does this, right? So they, they actually flip it twice. Black letter, white background, you. White letter, black ground, black background, S, black letter, white background, A. That's pretty cool, right? So that's another reversible figure. Um, I pulled up this one. This was an old logo for the Big Ten. It was when they first brought Penn State into the conference for money, for football. What do you see in the middle there? 11. The Big Ten had 11 teams. Like, write an essay about that. Um, and then... Somebody, um, I asked in the 8 o'clock class if they had any other good examples, and they brought up this one. I think she just yelled it out because she wanted ice cream. But See the B and the R? And then you could take the 31 and then put it on the, the background and make the, the, the part of the B and part of the R become the number 31 because 31 flavors, right? Anybody have any other good examples you can think of? Pepsi. Is that a new Pepsi one? Let's see. I'll pull it up. See what images we find. Which part of it are you talking about? This is reversible? No. Oh, okay. That one's a little bit different. So that I don't think that's necessarily reversible. Anybody have another one you think is? Yeah. Toastito. Oh, you're right. It's the two people, right? I know my chips. I got that. <laughs> I'm on that. Let's get it. You and I will go have some chips at lunch together. <laughs> Come on. Atta girl. There you go. All right. Um, this guy. Oh, shit. <laughs> there it is. See, the T's can be converted into two, two people. And the I, right, the dot over the I is like a bowl. I mean, imagine now if you were like eating Tostitos chips as a FedEx truck went by at a Baskin Robbins, like <laughs> watching USA on your phone, don't do all that. Your brain just might completely explode. All right, so that's the idea there with the reversible figures. Pretty simple idea, right? That's not, that's not anything that's going to make you have major problems getting your head around it. All right? Um, what's next? So we've done bottom-up versus top-down perceptual parsing. Oh, the Gestalt principles. We've got three of them, and these are pretty straightforward. We've got a half hour to go. And we've got three big ideas to cover. Gestalt is the, from the German word for whole. Again, W-H-O-L-E. Talking about the entire of something. Um, the law of proximity is actually at work right now for me as I stand here and look out at you guys. Okay? The law of proximity says things that are near each other are perceived as belonging together. Okay? Things that are near each other 
are perceived as belonging together. That's what proximity is a fancy word for closeness or nearness, right? Things that are near each other are perceived as belonging together. How is this working right now as I stand here and look at you guys? How do I see you? Do I see you as 426 individual people? Well, unfortunately, no. Right? How do I see you? You're one cluster here on the left because you're all close together. Right? Maybe a little too close. Right? You guys in the middle are either one giant cluster or maybe I split it and I have the, the back middle and the front middle. And then I've got you guys on the right. So based on proximity or closeness, we perceive some things as belonging together. I'll give you another example. When you're driving down the road and you're driving past an apple orchard and it's got thousands of apple trees, how do you perceive them? They're lined up, right? So those trees right there, there could be 150 of them. They're all lined up. You perceive them as one row, right? Proximity. So let me give you an example built into the slide here. How do you perceive these nine cubes? Well, it's about efficiency. That's really what, what these um, Gestalt principles are about. We efficiently process this as three columns of cubes. Why three columns? Well, if we do the math here, the upper left cube is clearly closer to that one than it is to that one, right? It's closer to the one below it. So we group it that way. If you want to group it the other way, let's just change the proximity features and make the upper left closer to this guy next to it than to this guy down below. And now we group them this way, right? So again, proximity. Whatever is closer to each other, we perceive as belonging together. Um, you want another example? I, in the 8 o'clock class, I used the football huddles example, right? So you're watching the Super Bowl. Denver's over there. Carolina's over there, right? They're clustered together. They belong together based on proximity. Those guys belong together. They're based on proximity as well, okay? Second Gestalt principle is the law of similarity. What do you think this law is going to say? Things that are what? Things that are similar to each other get perceived as what? As belonging together. Okay? Things that are similar to each other are perceived as belonging together. Okay? Um, I'll, I, I, I'm sorry, I always do sports examples, but that's what I think of with a lot of this stuff. Um, my 11-year-old has a baseball game this afternoon. They're the Giants. They have orange jerseys. They're playing the Cubs who have blue jerseys. When the kids are out there warming up, how are you going to mentally make sense of the 24 kids on the field? While the orange shirts are similar, they belong together, even if they're not right next to each other in terms of proximity. And then the blue shirt kids, that's another group. They belong together. Right? They could be lining up, throwing, or whatever to warm up. So similarity, similar things get grouped with each other. Okay? So this is an alternating series of columns here. Column one is apples right? Column two is pears. Column three is apples. Column four is pears, right? With these Gestalt principles, again, what we're trying to do is be more efficient, right? It's more efficient for me to perceive you guys as three or four clusters of students than it is to me to perceive you as 426 people, okay? Right? So we're going for that kind of efficiency. It's, it's not efficient. No one looks at this and is like, dude, it's rows of apples, pears, apples, pears. <laughs> right? I mean, that's just weird. Nobody, nobody does that, right? Um, over here. Well, now we've turned it, and so similarity is in, in play here as we have a row of apples, a row of pears, a row of apples, and a row of pears. Okay? So we've got proximity, closeness, is, is a, a, a basis for gathering things together. Similarity is another basis. The third thing that we do here in terms of these holes, W-H-O-L-E-S, is called closure. When you look at this object, what do you perceive it as? It's a triangle, right? You look at this like, okay, cool, I got it, so I should just fill in the blanks here, I guess. That line and that line. Now we've got a triangle, right? So if you have a friend who has not particularly good handwriting, and probably you do because you guys can't write anymore because you're always doing this, right? And like they write something, you're like, okay, let me try to figure out what they were writing or if you're trying to make sense of what I scribble up here, right? Here I am writing the word, well, I think that's stop or maybe it's slop, right? 
So in my mind, I've got to fill in this across. I've got to connect this so it actually looks like, okay, uh, connect that. Okay, yeah, now I see, yeah, it is the word stop. Or somebody does a sketch, right? They do a sketch. Here's the guy. There's, this is the worst sketch ever. <laughs> okay, here it is. Okay, well, I've got to fill in the blanks. And I've got to assume that like, his hair is actually connected to his head, right? That the ear is not just floating like a half an inch from his head. We fill all this stuff in mentally. We do this closure because it makes sense in terms of efficiency to make sense of it that way, right? Nobody, by the way, looks at this figure that I started with. Nobody does this, do they? Dude, it's a triangle floating above a trapezoid. <laughs> right? No, what makes sense in terms of efficiency is you disconnect those sides there, you make it a triangle. This mouse sucks. Okay? That's what we do to make sense of that in terms of closing things out. All right. I'm going through clicker question withdrawal, so I've got to ask you one. It's been a while, hasn't it? Since before the test. So here's a pretty easy one, I hope. Although a few keys on the piano were broken, Shana couldn't prevent herself from mentally filling the missing notes of the familiar melodies. So she's filling in the blanks of what's missing here. Does that sound like proximity, similarity, continuity, or closure? All right. We've got about 20-some minutes to do our final two big ideas around depth perception and constancies. One of these I didn't even talk about, by the way. All right. That looks pretty good. That's closure, right? You're filling in the blanks. You're completing what's missing. Excellent. All right. Let's talk about depth cues. We're going to end up talking about three different types. I'm going to begin with the first two, and then I'm going to sneak in the third one. The first two can be broken up into either binocular depth cues or monocular depth cues. We're going to begin with the binocular depth cues, which are predicated on the fact that your two eyes are not on top of each other. There's a disparity in the image of nearby objects that is projected to the left eye versus the right eye. We call that either binocular disparity. Sometimes you'll see that called retinal disparity. So let me just sneak in retinal disparity is another term for what we're talking about here. Okay. What does this mean? Well, let me just grab, let me just grab the water bottle. That always works. Um, Put on the counter here, and if I stand right here and look at the water bottle, okay, because my two eyes are not on top of each other, they're slightly apart from each other, the image as I stand here with the bottle on my left side of my body is slightly different to my left eye versus my right eye. It's closer, right, we do the geometry work here, to my left eye than it is to my right eye. Okay, well, if I move over here, now it's on the right side, it's a little closer to my right eye than my left eye. We get this slightly different image. There's a disparity. It just means there's a difference in the image going to left eye and right eye. And then ultimately what happens is your brain will use that disparity to compute distances to nearby objects. So maybe I take this little eraser and sit it here. For those of you in the back who can't see it, it's a little bit closer to me than the water bottle is. And as I look at those two objects, these differences with, with respect to left eye and right eye image will help me compute that the eraser is closer to me than the water bottle is. I almost poked myself in the eye doing the demonstration. Okay, So this is one simple one that is related to the use of both eyes. We're going to go to monocular depth cues in a couple minutes where it's about either one eye or in fact more often it's about looking at a two-dimensional object. But when we're in the three-dimensional world here, we get this slightly different image between the two eyes. Um, if you don't believe me that there's a slightly different image, here's a little um, depiction of this. On average, your eyes are about 65 millimeters apart from each other. We've got object A and object B. This could be the eraser versus the water bottle. 
A is closer to the left eye than it is to the right eye. Conversely, B is closer to the right eye than it is the left eye. We get these slightly different images, and what we do is compute very quickly that A is closer to me than B is. Okay? You don't need to remember 65 millimeters or any of that, that kind of thing. There are a couple things that you can use to demonstrate this binocular disparity and how it affects our perception of depth. One of them is to continue with the theme of toys today. We talked about Legos and other things. Um, this toy. How many of you guys had one of these when you were a kid? The rest of you, your parents clearly didn't love you very much. Okay. So, although it's getting to the point where this is almost like too old of an old school toy. This is the Viewmaster Viewer. You remember this? You would slide the little disc in the top and you'd go like this, right? And you'd look at whatever. My mom, when we got, the, we got this for my oldest, my mom sent me our stuff from when I was a kid. And it's like, you know, these 70s, like Disneyland things. And there's like three things at Disneyland that you could do. Um, and there were ones of like Pooh Bear and Tigger. Why is Pooh Bear closer to me than Tigger? Well, because of the, this retinal disparity situation. Okay? That's one way to, to demonstrate retinal disparities with that Viewmaster viewer. The other is with this. It's going to be the highlight of the class right now, I'm telling you. Okay? Don't start doing this until I explain to you how to do it. You could hurt yourself. I also think that you can use this. I know Haley and Kristen have heard me say this. You can use this. There are my SI leaders hanging out front. Um, you could use this to meet someone this weekend. I'm just telling you. If you're at a party, there's somebody pretty attractive you want to start a conversation with, and you're looking for that starter, here's your starter. Okay. So... And if you do it and it's successful, please come back and tell me because I've been saying this for 15 years and no one has ever come back and said, I got to talk to her because of that. Okay. <laughs> so here's the deal. You look at an object in the distance. So you guys could pick like this red thing here, the exit sign. There's a similar red thing on that back wall that I look at when I do this demo. Look at that object in the distance. Put your arms out in front of you with your fingers pointing in. Okay, everybody do it. Arms out front, fingers pointing in. I am now a cult leader. This is it. This is like, you know, remember the purple sheets and the black Nikes? Here we are. Let's all kill ourselves and we'll ride on the... Okay, so look at that object in the distance and bring your fingers together. And then at a certain point, oh my God, there it is. It pops in. And if you want to really freak yourself out or really, you know, extend that conversation with him or her, wiggle your fingers up and down a little bit. I got to get video of you guys doing this. Just one... <laughs> One time I need to have this. So why is this finger sausage appearing? Okay. I don't know if that's the term you want to use. I want to talk to you about this finger sausage. Uh, so it's appearing because you've got this slightly different image coming to left eye and right eye of two different objects right there in your immediate visual field. Okay. Isn't that really cool? I know, I'm going to walk across campus today at lunch and somebody's going to be like, <laughs> just like that. If I see it, I'll be like, yeah, way to go. All right, what about monocular depth cues? Let's do three of these real quick. These are pretty straightforward. And I'm going to bet that there are artists in the audience here in the class who know a lot more about these things and could give even better examples. And there are probably two or three others we could put up here, but let's just do these three. Interposition. You'll sometimes hear it called occlusion, O-C-C-L-U-S-I-O-N, occlusion. Occlusion and interposition basically mean if something blocks out something else, the thing that is doing the blocking out is perceived as, belong as being closer to me. So here's a, a circle that looks like it's lying on top of the triangle, doesn't it? So the occlusion is about the blocking out of the lower right piece of that triangle. Do you guys see that? So which one is closer to you, the circle or the triangle? The circle, because it's blocking out. You could draw a picture of a house where part of the tree limbs of a tree out front are blocking the upper right side of the house, if you're a good artist, right? You could draw that real quick, okay? Um, you could draw, you know, a bus driving in front of a, a building in downtown and the bus blocks out maybe the lower left side of that building. That's occlusion, right? Where something blocks something else out. Here's the one from, um, I forget if this is from your textbook or an old textbook. 
The horse is blocking out the tree. The horse is closer than the tree. The woman is blocking out the tree. She's closer than the tree. Then they kind of play around with it and make this tree back here, which looks like it's farther away when you look at the base, appear as if it's closer here. They're trying to violate this to make you see like, okay, that looks weird to me because I'm used to situations where when something blocks something else out, it's closer to me. So interposition is just that. Um, if you want to draw a picture of two hands where the right hand blocks out por the portion of the left hand, that would again be this interposition scenario. Okay? What's my second one? Oh, linear perspective. The simplest one I can ever show with linear perspective is just um, the sides of a road looking like they're converging. Right? So this is a road that you're drawing. And it looks like the sides of the road or railroad tracks. You want to draw railroad tracks. It looks like they converge. Right? If you take a picture of railroad tracks as you look down the line, it looks like those sides of the tracks converge. Okay? Do they really converge? No. What we use here is a vanishing point. Right? So this is where I would turn to the artists in the audience and tell us more about the use of vanishing points. Right? Here's a vanishing point off in the distance, and we've got those sides of the, the road looking like they're going to be converging there. Okay? Um, this is the little goofy one I built into the side, the freight elevator for the man who has everything. We're making this look like this is converging by having these rectangles get closer and closer together as they move down. Right? It makes it look like this is pretty far away from you. It's not. It's a flat two-dimensional drawing in this case that is, um, is there in two dimensions, but it makes it look like this part here is farther away. It looks like it's pushed into the, the screen a little bit. Okay? The third and final one is called texture gradient. Pretty simple rule of thumb here. More texture for things that are what? Closer to me. Less texture for things that are farther away. Look at the texture on this little picture here. A lot more texture around these two things that look like spheres almost popping out of the screen. Where does the texture go away? In these dark areas here, lower left and towards the upper right, there's not much texture at all. That looks like it's pushed into the screen, right? So these two spheres look like they're popping out of the screen. These two dark areas look like they're pushed in. They're receding into the screen. It's because of the lack of texture here. Um, if you're a good artist right now, you could even sketch something like, you know, a little beach scene where you're looking down the beach and it's, there are cliffs next to the beach here. And the rocks on the cliffs right here, as you're painting it, will have a lot more texture detail than would the, the rocks on the cliff and a half mile down, down the beach there. Okay? So, again, the take-home message there is more texture equals closer. Make sense? Okay. One more depth perception cue, and then we'll talk about the constancies to finish up. The motion cue for depth perception we're going to talk about here is called relative motion parallax. It's a weird word. It's a weird term, but the idea is pretty simple. Before I even give you the details here, think about the last time you were, um, I don't know, driving out to Vegas, or you're on some road in the middle of nowhere. You're going, you know, 80s to Phoenix, okay? And you get out there and you're going like 90 because there's no one around, right? And you look out the window. You're not the driver. Let's say you're the passenger because you're looking out the side window. When you look out the side window, how quickly is the stuff right next to you on the side of the road going by? Super fast, right? What about things off in the distance like the mountains over there? Do they look like they're going by at 90? No, it's kind of weird. They look like they're going by slowly. You're like, oh, man. We're, going, we're not going fast enough because those mountains are barely moving, right? It's going to take us a long time to get there. Well, that's this relative motion parallax thing, that the distance of objects from you determines how quickly those objects seem to be moving by. So what seems to look like it's moving by really quickly? Things that are closer. What about things that are farther away? Looks like they move by a lot more slowly. So this woman is riding the coaster, let's say, up to Oceanside. She's going from left to right. As she looks out the window, she would see the, the white picket fence here moving by a lot more quickly than these bushes or trees behind the house over there. Okay? So nearby objects appear to pass quickly. Distant objects appear to pass more slowly. Okay? So if you were driving through the middle of Indiana somewhere, and Indiana, if you haven't ever been there, is super flat. Right? 
driving through some farmland and maybe you're trying to determine is that grain silo or that barn closer to me well one way to figure it out would be to look and see which one looks like it's moving by more quickly the closer it is to you the more quickly it is moving by so if you find the one that is moving by more quickly that's the object that necessarily would be closer to you okay so these depth cues again we've got the binocular one because of the two different um, images projected to left and right eye we've got the monocular depth cues if you're painting or you're sketching something you can use some tricks to make some things appear farther away or closer and if you're moving you've got this um, relative motion parallax um, cue any questions on those at all does that make sense and again if you're in art if you're really good at art I know there's stuff beyond interposition and um, linear perspective and texture gradient I know there's probably three or four others we could do I think those three cover enough ground for us all right final segment and I've got one more clicker question at the very end that I want to do with you guys perceptual constancies is the fifth and final of the big ideas for today and it refers to the ability to retain an unchanging percept of an object despite variations in the retinal image what does that mean in English? It means that when you fly out over Ocean Beach, you don't get worried that, oh my God, they shrunk SeaWorld. Okay? SeaWorld is still the same size. That tower is still pretty darn tall. Okay? Those buildings or those trucks or those cars are still regular size. You have an unchanging percept of those objects, despite the retinal image is different, right? When I stand here in the front of the classroom, we could talk about size constancy, not only with that example, but in this example in the classroom. When I stand here at the front of the classroom, how tall do you guys at the front look to me? Pretty tall. How about you guys in the back? Oh, cool, all the short people sat in the back again. No, you're normal-sized people. You're probably all somewhere between 4'6 six and 6'6, six, six, right? If I didn't have size constancy, when we get done in eight minutes and you guys in the back started walking up it would scare the daylights out of me right because as you move up what happens oh shit now she's five nine. Oh Jesus she's six seven no she gonna be 14 feet by the time she gets up here right no I understand in terms of size constancy that I've got variations in that retinal image but those are average size people in the back of the classroom so here's my size constancy example it's a picture of these folks. Here's a family taking a hike through the woods. These guys are wandering off through the woods. Let's show you size constancy. <coughs> so you know, sometimes it takes a little while to kind of rumble through. If you missed it, we copied this guy and pasted him down there. And now he's a knee-high guy. That's like that's he's like two feet tall. Is he really two feet tall? When we were back here, did you think, God, that guy is super short. It's like, it's like a foot and a half. Like we put a pair of socks on him, it would just cover him up, right? Just envelop his whole body. No, he's a normal size guy. You have size constancy capacities, and you understand that he's a normal size guy, even though as he moves off, he appears to be much smaller, okay? Anybody see the old lady? She's hiding in the trees. Yeah, over there. Somebody's going to print them out and try to find her. Alright. Shape constancy. When these rectangular doors open, what shape do they become as you look at them? Trapezoids again. Twice today. Trapezoids. Okay. So this one here, like up top in the middle, oh damn, now that's a trapezoid. It's never going to close right. Because the cutout is a rectangle. We're screwed now. No. We understand, like, that shape has changed, but I know that it's just a rectangle with a different image being projected to my visual system, okay? This guy here, that's also a rectangle. Um, if you want another shape constancy example, if you took a series of rapid pictures of a quarter as it's spun, right? You spin a quarter around. Sometimes it looks like a regular old quarter. What does a quarter look like when it turns this way? It's kind of just like a line up and down. What is that, right? It's the same object. It has the same shape. The image to your visual system has changed, but the object has it. Final one, and then a clicker question with five minutes to go. Lightness constancy. Do any of you guys look at this wall and think like, oh, wow. 
that's really cool how they painted that dark <laughs> and that gray with like this little... No, you don't think that. This is a white wall, right? What's happening here? Shadows. Nobody looks at this wall here like, dude, look how they painted that wall. <laughs> like that weird shape that's darker and then this is like lighter and then it's like darker down here again, right? It's lightness constancy. The visual image is changing, but you're perceiving it as being the same. Final clicker question. The fence posts are whizzing by. The farm hardly seems to move. What are we illustrating there? So let me tell you what happens next. Thursday is a one-day, one-chapter section on consciousness, sleep, dreams, and drugs, and alcohol. Because we finish a chapter today and we finish a chapter Thursday, what does that mean for quizzes? You got two full chapters worth due Sunday night. The chapter on sensation and perception and the chapter on consciousness. Don't forget to do them. Those are the easy points. Some of you don't care whether you got it right or wrong. I feel the love. There you go. 97% of you got it. That's two points for all 437 of you. I'll see you online on Thursday. Back here next Tuesday. All right, give me a second here.